What a treat, my friends. Please say hello to Stephen Fry. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Thank you very much. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Excellent. Nice Welcome to, be to the here. show. Thank you. What, what a pleasure. treat. Oh, and for me, too. Never mind your uh, your fine body of work. I've been following you on Twitter. Oh, I thought you were going to stop on the word body. No, no, yes, true. <laughs> it would be awkward for the audience if I went there so early. <laughs> You're right. You usually after the commercial Work break. Work your way up to it, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, now, I want to talk about your book, but I also want to talk to you about the Glenn Gould thing, uh, which are Yes, involved. that's just why I'm here, as it were. Well, Glenn Gould was a, was a magnificent pianist and an extraordinary man, and had long been a hero of mine. And uh, when I was invited by the Glenn Gould Foundation to be part of the jury for the Glenn Gould Prize, I leapt at it. Oh, Most I mean, people don't realize that recorded music is the way it is because Glenn Gould yeah. decided you can bring a concert to a living room. Exactly. So how does one determine what a cultural artistic achievement is? It's a really tricky one. It's... it's um, it's almost like sex. It's, you know, or love, I suppose. It's Suddenly everybody went, I'm in. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's just the thing that makes you go zing. You know, we should, we should always remember that feelings come first with human beings. That, that there are primal things, emotion. And if you're trying to judge who is a great artist, a great contributor to world culture, however you, you put it, yes, you can list they've done this, they've done that, they've done the other, but it's the thing that makes you go slightly swimmy in the head, mm -hmm. makes your blood sing in your ears. That's the thing. Have you always approached your craft with that in mind? I have, actually. Oddly enough, I, I get mistakenly accused of being in, an intellectual. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I like to believe that I have intellectual curiosity and that yeah. I'm, uh, I, I like reading and I like ideas and I like talking. But I think a lot of people know a huge amount. There's a fantastic thirst to know things that people have, and they're put off it. Well, if they want to know anything about your 20s, it's right here. It is, okay. yeah. First of all, I thought, if this is your book up until your 30th birthday, <laughs> which is what it is, you've had a hell of a life. Well, that's true. I, I mean, it was an interesting time, uh, for me, at least, and, and a lot of it to do with university, to do with the fact... It starts with me coming out of prison, <laughs> which is uh, an unfortunate thing that happened to me when I was uh, 17, 18. You weren't in there for two days. You spent, you know. Oh, I was in there for yeah. fair, fair old time. Uh, credit card uh, fraud. fraud. Um, yeah. And it was then that I decided that it really was time for me to pick myself up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, when I left, I, I got home and I went to a, a local city college, which was enrolling. I was just. The day, literally, I arrived back home from prison, they, they said, you know, you, we're taking people on. I was, it was on the last day. I was at the end of the queue. I asked to, to do these subjects. They said, we're full up. And I said to the guy, I said, no, you've got to let me. You've actually got to let me take these exams because I will get A grades and I will then get a scholarship to Cambridge and you'll be proud of me. He said, what? <laughs> He said, we, we don't do the Cambridge entrance exam. I said, no, no, I'll do it myself. I'll pay for it and I'll invigilate, and you know, I'll pay one of you to, to invigilate for it, yeah. and I will get the... And they said, whoa, all right then. And in that moment, my life, that was like a hinge mm -hmm. in which my life changed, because I, I did fortunately get a scholarship to Cambridge, and I went there, and that's where I met Hugh and Emma. And What's fantastic about that, though, is that life, for it to work out relatively OK, you need people who, for no reason discernible, yeah. who have no reason to believe in you, to give you a break. That's absolutely right, yeah. And that just shows how fragile it, all exactly. this is. That was, as I say, it was like a hinge, and, and, and uh, my whole life turned. It could have turned the other way, and I could have... Who knows? So, uh, what, uh, what's actually cool about this book is that you do talk a lot about and you show a lot of pictures of you and the guys and the girls in the early days. Yes. Uh, you know, um, and some young photos with fabulous glasses in here. But <laughs> the show you did with Hugh Laurie, and the, you must be really pleased with the way his career has blown up as well. Hugh, well, what's he doing now? Uh, I thought he, he, he well, <laughs> he became a doctor actually. Oh, did he? He's oh, a doctor. He's, he's got, and they've done they sort of did a documentary series about him. <laughs> he's very much like Sherlock Holmes. No, I, he's I, even I, called House. <laughs> I, I am, of course, insanely proud of him. And uh, thanks to Charlie Sheen's uh, explosion, he is now <laughs> the highest-paid actor on television. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's even better. And not only that, he's now also he's just releasing a, a blues album. He's always been passionate musician and an incredibly talented one. I mean, ever since I first knew. I mean, always would be, he could play the piano, the guitar, the mouth organ, the saxophone, any instrument you gave him, he would master it. And never being able to read music, just an, an insanely. Were you guys competitive? Never. never. It was one of the extraordinary things when we met. It was Emma Thompson who introduced us. Um, oh, I, I'd, love. She, I, I, I'd heard that you, you do love yeah. her, and she is worthy of your love. Yes, yeah. <laughs> She's a marvelous woman, but she is taken. Yes. Um, She's taken currently. Yeah, it's, currently. A, it's a long yeah. life, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're right, and it's honorable that you're, you're able to wait. Uh, it, 
but she, um, she and I were in lots of plays together at, uh, at Cambridge, and she, she introduced me to, to Hugh because she thought we'd, we'd get on together. And, and when, when we first met, um, she took me to his rooms, and uh, Hugh's girlfriend at the time, Katie, opened the door. Hugh was sitting on a, on a bed with a guitar on his, uh, uh, on his knees, and uh, I said hello, and he went, hello. And, uh, and he said, I've just written this song. And I said, oh, and he played it to me. And it was a funny song, very funny song. And he said, what do you think? And I said, it's good. I said, and I suggested some sort of tweak to the lyrics. And he then pulled out a couple of sketches he'd been writing, and we started working on those. And about three hours later, we sort of introduced ourselves properly. Mm -hmm. And it was like love at first sight, and it was a collaborative love at first sight. We just started working and writing together and carried on doing that for years. And I still see him. I mean, obviously, he spends nine months of the year in, in Los Angeles, doing his, applying his trade as a grumpy doctor. What, what you guys were able to pull was, um, which is what anybody, even if they're not in your business, is looking for, which is a, a place to belong. Yeah. And a sense of belonging. When you look back at those days, what do you think of those days? Well, it is, yes, friendship. First and foremost, friendship. The fact that we, we adored and still do adore each other. And, and I, I, I think it's just incredible good luck. And Emma, I see a lot as well. There was a, there was a sketch um, we wrote together at university, um, and I remember Emma and Hugh and I were in it, and we, we needed to have a judge. It was an American courtroom sketch, and we cast Tilda Swinton, who was a friend at university as well. And, and I was thinking about that when I was writing the book and thought, my goodness, Tilda just won an Oscar two years ago. Emma has won two Oscars. Hugh has won 40 Golden Globes and <laughs> 70 Emmys, and goodness knows how many other awards. And, and there we were, sort of 20-year-olds, um, at university with, without the faintest idea that we could have a career in show business at all. So there's no question I'd be unbelievably lucky. And, and I have to kick myself sometimes. You know what's interesting about reading this book and just following you even online and, and, and your story, you're really open about a lot. Mm. Especially your insecurities. This book is rife with your struggles, man. Yes, I'm afraid it is. I, I, and I know that there's something rather tedious about uh, people in the public eye going on about how lonely and insecure they feel or their list of addictions and so on. But I think if one phrases it right and one is honest about oneself, it is also, I hope, a very, um, a very vindicating thing for people to read. I certainly, when I, when I was a teenager and riddled with all the insecurities that teenagers naturally have, especially being gay. Uh, 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 my generation was, was quite a, you know, a scary thing to, to imagine being, um, that my life might well be one of, you know, uh, illegal horror and blackmail and, you know, just general misery. And uh, also a feeling that I was just different from everybody else in all kinds of ways. And you think you're the only person who feels that. And what you yearn is for a writer, or a songwriter. It could be Leonard Cohen or Morrissey from The Smiths. Yeah. Somebody who touches you, says, I'm with you, you're not alone. We're all scared inside. We may all walk big. And those guys who walk along and look really cocky, they're the ones who are most scared. Mm -hmm. They're deeply scared. We're all, you know, we all think everybody else has got a big club while we've got a tiny Q-tip behind <laughs> us. And, Ooh, that's all I've got. <laughs> and, and, you know, we all think we've just missed out on, 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 on what life, you know, the secrets of life. And everybody else has got it. Everybody else is, yeah. But the, the, the wonderful secret is that we're all equally afraid and uncertain. And that, that isn't a bad thing, it's a wonderful thing. Well, it's, I think a lot of people too, in, it, they, they, uh, we grow up watching movies and TV shows and thinking that's what we're supposed mm. to be like. Yeah. And as an artist and as a creator of this stuff, um, it, it, certainly in certain generations, you never saw frailties on television. Mm. It wasn't until Magnum P.I. and, and, uh, and um, uh, the show James Garner was in. Oh, Rockford, uh, the yeah, Rockford, Rockford Files. Where, where when, a, when a hero would punch somebody, he would hurt his hand. Oh, exactly. And that was, such, that was a watershed yes. moment, right? Yes. It, can the same be in comedy? Can frailties be played out differently in comedy? Absolutely. Especially, and I, I, this is not sort of mad patriotism, but especially British comedy, I think, and actually Canadian, too. Um, American comedy is fantastic for wisecracking um, guys, but they're usually the, if, if, if you'll excuse my French, the, I think of like John Belushi in Animal House. Right. Brilliant performance when there's the little folk singer on his guitar, John Belushi just takes the guitar and smashes him over the head with it and everybody laughs. Now that's great, but to me a real comedian would want to play the folk singer. Right. Not the bully. That's all John Belushi was. A brilliant bully, don't yeah. get me wrong. But he was, I'm the guy with his, the biggest dick in the room, right. is essentially an American comic's view of life. Whereas a British comic's view of life is, I've arrived at a party, 
Oh, I forgot my dick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's a better place to be, right. you know? I think because most of us are the little guy in life, c the comedians who, who, who kind of expose the bully mm -hmm. are better than the braggart comedians who are just chewing gum and being, being you know, brave and wise and... Well, that's one, you know, that's a big part of Charlie Sheen's meltdown on Twitter was the fact that he, he acted that way. But, you know, we, we were talking about it and reading your book. Do you ever see stories like that and think, but by the grace of God, there go you? you oh, know, yes. Yeah? Yes, I do absolutely sympathize with Charlie Sheen because I know what it's like to be an addictive personality. I, I, I don't know what it's like to go quite that nuts, and I hope I would never treat people quite as badly. But you had a public season. breakdown, though. Oh, I did indeed. What, 18 years ago? Yeah, I did. I, I was cast in a play, and I, I was in a very low state about it, and I... Uh, I walked out, not to put too fine a point on it. There was a Saturday night performance, and on Sunday morning at about dawn, I drove to a, a channel port in the south of England and, and drove my car onto a boat and uh, went to Europe and just drove and drove and drove east um, without telling anybody where I was they going. They were looking for you. And they were, they certainly were. Uh, and the police were looking in the attic and uh, digging up the garden of my house, thinking I might have done away with myself. And it was a very bad moment, but in the, on the uh, 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 other... And it was what I believe alcoholics call a moment of clarity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I always thought was a moment when you spill claret over yourself. <laughs> no, I've, you see, I've, I've gone all clarity. <laughs> what the hell? But there's a moment when you're with your car and you're waiting to get on the ferry yeah. and you have to make the decision, I'm going to drive onto the ferry or yeah. I'm not, because once you're on, you're on it. Absolutely. There's What's no, going no on in your mind there? But, uh, what was going on in my mind was that I couldn't stay. I couldn't be in England. I couldn't be... Inv I had to try and, I mean, I don't know what I thought, I imagined in some fantastic way that I would drive up to the east and north of Germany and cross the border through Schleswig-Holstein into Denmark and go to the north of Denmark um, and somehow learn Danish <laughs> and, um, and, and get a big white polo neck pullover and a pipe uh, and sit on rocks and write poems. Um, <laughs> It was a strange fantasy. But what it actually ended up with was, was me um, feeling much better about myself in the right. end. Because I realised that I had a, an issue with, with, with mood swings, uh, bipolar disorder. And I, I made a couple of films for the BBC some years later called The Secret Life of the Manic Depressive, mm -hmm. which was a really interesting thing to do because I met people who had the problem even far more than, than I had. Um, and it made me, A, extremely grateful for, for not having you know, manic depression or bipolar disorder as bad badly as they did, but also grateful for knowing that, um, that one could make a programme about it and try and help alleviate some of the stigma that surrounds mental health issues. I don't know many people, actually, worth knowing, who don't have a mind that sometimes leads them astray. Right. You know, I don't know that sanity, real, sober, sensible sanity, is such a glorious thing. I think most of the world's advances in creativity and invention mm -hmm. and in almost anything have been done by little spurts of madness. And sometimes they can be destructive, and it's particularly hard for people who live with someone who suffers from mood disorder. The most amazing one was a man I met, um, I had been a commander in the Royal Navy. In fact, he'd, he'd, be, he'd been in charge of the... Uh, he'd been in charge of the, the royal yacht, Britannia, so, which was the Queen's yacht. Um, and he suffered really, really badly. And at one point he was in a, in a hospital with, with, a, with light security because he'd been, you know, talking to his people, you know, about the fact that he was considering suicide. He was really, really low. He managed to evade his secure, uh, security people. He walked out into the road in front of a lorry. And his legs were smashed to pieces and so badly that he had dozens of operations with pins, had them rebroken and rebroken. And it took, took years to get his legs right so he could walk. And I, I remember saying to him, my God, the pain you must have been in when did all these operations. He said, yes. He said, but you have to remember, that pain was nothing like as bad as the pain inside that made me walk into the traffic. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing people don't understand about really severe depression. There's a, there's a very much an attitude, oh, go and walk it off. Yeah. You know, you just go have a good walk, listen to some music, you'll be fine. It's the stiff upper lift. Yeah, right? yeah. and, and it, it's unfortunately not... It just isn't like that. It's, it's like saying walk off the weather. You know, the weather is real and it's right. the weather inside you. You can't Did you ever get it. that low? Um, yeah, I, I tried to end my life on a number of occasions. Pre-20s, pre uh, a couple of times with a huge mixture of pills. Fortunately for me, it was such a mixture and they, they went together so badly that uh, my brother, um, who, who had a bedroom some, some way away from mine in, in, in my parents' house, was awakened by the sound of my projectile vomit. <laughs> and, and he came in and I was sort of unconscious, but spewing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was taken to a hospital and had my stomach pumped, so that was very fortunate. On another occasion, and again, it's sort of faintly comic, really, is, um, 
is I put myself in a um, in a garage and put a, a, a duvet, sort of quilt, uh, under the door and put my finger on the keys of the car and, um, and really was thinking of turning the key. But How did you get out of that, though? Like... I, it was my parents. It was the thought of, of, of doing that to my parents. Just I couldn't bear the idea of how they would respond. I knew that it was a, an awful thing to do to them, that no matter how much I didn't at the time want to live, I couldn't bear the idea of doing that to them. And, um, and that's as good a reason to live. You know, it's a, um, there's a poem by Dorothy, L, uh, Dorothy Parker that, that ends, every line ends, you might as well live. And, and sometimes life does seem unsupportable. Not for any logical reason, that's the point. You can't talk someone out of finding life unpleasant by saying, look what you've got. Because right. it's not about that. But, but you can perhaps at least say, look what it will do to other people. All right, stick around. Stephen's actually big in social media. We're going to talk about a little bit more of this and find out if he has any tweets that he regrets. Answer <laughs> Paul's view with Stephen Fry when we come back. <laughs> it's fantastic. Man. It's really good. Gentlemen, welcome to a bit of fry and lorry. Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue à un morceau de fry et lorry. Stout, messy, bim. Gutienda, fenstupke, fry, stink lorry. <laughs> Go to fry and lorry, see them fry and hear lorry. Um, who plays a better doctor, him on House or you on Bones? Oh, 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 well, I think I'll have to hand the palm to Hugh there. Though I do enjoy being on Bones. I play a, a, a sort of a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist, whereas Hugh, as you know, plays a grumpy old sod, which he sure he's does. very good at. You know, um, you, your Twitter feed is fantastic. You've got millions of followers. Yes. Uh, how, do, you, do you ever regret any of the things you put out there? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, re tweet in haste, repent at leisure uh, <laughs> is basically the, uh, the thing. And, and, and I sometimes, you know, if I've had a few drinks and someone tweets something offensive or mean or stupid, I will tweet back instantly and then suddenly I'm accused of being a bully or not being able to take criticism or being taking things too seriously or indeed just, you know, using my influence. It's, you suddenly realise, because if you have a large number of followers and you retweet something that you find amusing... Mm -hmm. People who don't find it amusing think you're endorsing the point of view of someone you're right. retweeting, and they think you're you're misusing your influence. And suddenly, and also they in, think that it is your duty to retweet any charity that they are doing. Now there are thousands of people out there doing wonderful bike rides for this charity and that charity that are all incredibly good and useful. But I, I can't feel that it's my duty to have to retweet every single one of those things because I'd become like a sort of public bulletin board of good causes and right. it would become a bore. Absolutely. Uh, and you have to make Twitter personal. I think the thing that most upsets me is people who say how, you know, businessmen have, have these days have conventions. How to maximise your Twitter potential for your business, you know. And you think you just don't get it. Social media means social media, which means people. Right. The only and the only way for politicians or businessmen or people trying to make a buck to use Twitter is to use it as themselves. Just be honest. Be quirky, weird, strange, whatever you are. Be you. But don't try and second guess because even though it's 140 characters, even though it isn't in your handwriting, it's just in computer text. Twitter audiences can easily detect a bullshitter and they can easily detect someone who's selling something and they can easily detect a liar. So just just be yourself. And plus for you, it doesn't you just get the you get the opportunity to talk to people who want to hear from you whenever you feel like it. Yes, it is it is it's a it's an extraordinary thing. I mean of course it started off as just a few hundred years a few yeah. years ago. Um, and it just grew and grew and grew until suddenly it became this worldwide phenomenon. And uh, I have had some many you know I've had bad moments on it, no question. I've been an idiot. I've done stupid things on it and, you know, said things I really shouldn't have done, and, and I've learned. What's um, the strangest thing you've ever read about yourself? I, I've ever written about myself? Read. Oh, about read yourself. about myself. Yeah. Um, I think there was some journalist who described me as handsome, and I looked in the mirror and I thought, that woman is off her um, <laughs> medication. <laughs> Do you have any advice for Prince William and Kate? Uh, oh, poor things, yes. Um, I'm very, obviously, delighted for anybody who, who uh, decides to commit to the, their lives to each other. But when it's in the glare of publicity such as theirs is, I would say, um, yes, don't read a single newspaper for the rest of your lives. All right, the book here is called The Fry Chronicles. Stephen Fry, everybody. We'll be right back. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.